en dan nog even op volgende woorde gesê. Je kent twee nieuwe Bijbels toen Nehemiah chapter 3. <coughs> Nehemiah chapter 3. And we're continuing with our series. And I think um, most of you who, who were here and following the sermons, it, was, it's, it has been a very good um, teaching in Nehemiah 3. And it has been a very good time for us. So I hope this morning will also now. I'm, I'm, this morning I'm not going to read all the scriptures. <laughs> Who of you went through chapter 3? Okay, yeah, I'm only going to refer to the scriptures and some of them I'm going to refer to. And uh, while I was preparing, I, I said to myself, how do you preach from this? It's like going through number, numbers, numbers and Leviticus and you get all these names, <laughs> all these laws, and I said, goodness grief. But now I believe there is, there is something that we can learn from this, and I hope that um, the Lord will bless you this morning as well. Let's just come before the Lord and just ask His blessing. Lord, we thank You this morning that we can gather around Your Word. Thank You for this opportunity to share Your Word. And uh, Lord, may You just speak to each our heart this morning. May we go from here knowing that, Lord, You've touched our hearts. I pray that it will not just be a sermon. I pray that that we will respond to what we hear this morning and uh, change our lives, align our lives with Your will, and help us, Lord, to be what You want us to be. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Okay, so it's 32 verses, and it's a lot of names. It's a lot of um, names and things mentioned there. But I want to just maybe start by uh, recapping on, on some of the things we've already um, learned from the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now we've seen from Ezra and Nehemiah, and I don't know if you can remember that they are... Is the word there? Okay. Okay, maybe my, sermon's theme, my sermon theme for this morning is building together. So maybe that word, together... Okay? Is that fine? I don't know how many times it is in my sermon, but maybe you've got already one count for the kids. Okay, um, and we, see, we, we saw from Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah, we saw three movements happening, movements of reform and revolt. Now if I can just recap, in Ezra 1 to 6, you'll find that uh, it, it talks about the rebuilding of the temple. So the first movement of reformation and rebuild was the building of the temple in 539 to 515 before Christ. Now Ezra 7 to 10 was the second movement uh, of reformation of the people back to the law and back to the Torah. And that happened in 458 to 456 before Christ. And now in the book of Nehemiah, which we are busy with now, Nehemiah chapter 1 to 7 is the third movement, the rebuilding of the city walls. Now, in these, if, if these three movements are completed, completed, the Reformation, the temple being rebuilt, the people back to the law, and also um, <coughs> the city being rebuilt, the prophetic hope, the expected, expected hope that Israel had about... Um, uh, that we read about in Jeremiah chapter 30 and 30 to 33 is supposed to happen. There were, there were pro prophecy that God will restore them, God will bring them back to the, their land, He will restore the land, and then the kingdom of God will come. Now, if, if those three movements were completed, that is what's supposed to happen. But from history, we know that it did not happen. And in the end, we saw kind of an anti-climax happening in our mind. We're going to get this. So this, is, this story doesn't end well. It's not one of those stories that always ends well. Happily live ever after. Okay? But we'll get to that later on. Now the story of Nehemiah was also part of God's great plan. I don't know if you can remember that. It's part of God's great plan of redemption. And when we read the story of Nehemiah, we must always have this in mind that if we walk away from the story, we must be wiser regard, in regards to 
um, what Jesus has done to save us and that we need to respond in faith. We must walk wiser away from this. And Amaya, uh, the name literally meant comforted by the Lord. He was the royal cupbearer putting his life on the line every time when the king ate or drank something he needed to taste and see if there's no poison in it. So, wonderful job. Hopefully you don't die. Okay? And in spite of that, in spite of being an exile into a Gentile country, into um, away from Jerusalem, in a play, palace of a Gentile king, in spite of those things, Jeremiah knew the Bible, he studied the Bible, and he knew God's redemptive plan for Israel, and he knew what God promised it promised to them as a people. And we've we've gone through those scriptures um, before. Leviticus and Jeremiah 32, 32. So I mean, when, when Nehemiah heard the report from, um, uh, of Jerusalem, the Bible says he wept. He was in deep sorrow. He knew he had to do something. He knew he, want, he wanted to be part of God's great redemptive plan. So what did he do? He prayed and he fasted and he seeked the Lord's um, face. So he decided he wanted to be part of that. And even though the king noticed him, this is chapter 2, the king noticed Nehemiah's sorrow and he gave him after he requested to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city. Um, he, after that, even though the king re, um, gave him all the material, he gave him the letters to take to, to all the governors and in chapter, he, uh, 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 although everything was given and the requests were given to him, we read in chapter 2, 2 verse 18 that Nehemiah said that the hand of God was upon me for good. He clearly in his mind he knew this is God working. This is a God who is working in the king's heart. This is a God who is um, uh, providing and the king gave the resources. He gave the letters, the materials. He gave him the soldiers to protect him on his journey. Why? Because God worked in his heart. And we shouldn't miss that. And he believed, because, and the king believed that this was a worthy cause. Now, two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, remember we spoke about um, the king giving the request and uh, giving the resources and everything. And we learned from this, and I'm just going to repeat it again. We learned from that, that people who don't buy into to a vision or a cause, or don't believe that this is a, 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 a worthy cause, they will have no reason to support that ministry or that church for, this, for that matter. And we must pray that God will change our hearts, that He will work in our hearts so that we can stand, uh, understand the worthy cause of God for our church. So that we can understand both, we are here to build a people. Um, yes, we are building a building, but it's also building a people for God, connecting people to God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, mentoring them on their spiritual journey, and sending them out to become disciples as Jesus commanded us to do. Go, therefore, and make disciples unto the world, of the world. Baptize them and teach them. So, I, 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 I really truly believe in my heart, this is what God is calling us as a church to do. And yes, we need resources, we need finances, we need support, we need help. And my prayer is that if you don't have that divine discontent, that God will infuse that in your heart, that it will grip your heart like Nehemiah, that you will weep about the lost people and the broken world around us in the community, so that you will... Um, um, uh, also respond like the king responded to, ne to Nehemiah's request. So we saw in chapter 2 that Nehemiah actually went to Jerusalem. Do you remember that last week? We saw that he actually went. He left all his comfort. He left all his securities. The palace that he lived in. The he made the necessary sacrifice. And so we can only dream we can only imagine the great things that God can do in our church and in our community. But if we do not actually get up of our bones and go to and we'll go to the world and do what God commanded us, I promise you nothing's going to happen. 
Okay, God is sovereign. He can do anything. But God wants to work through us. He wants to use us. Remember last week's sermon, we talked about the necessary sacrifice <coughs> that we need to make sacrifices. We said that we need to take corporate ownership and that is what it means to take responsibility for something greater, for a greater cause than your own interests. We cannot sit back and wait for God to send better man, to send, to cry out to God and say, Lord, send heroes to accomplish those tasks that we, um, we uh, at which we faint and fail. We must take ownership. We must become those better men. We must become those heroes who makes a difference in our community. And we must be willing. And the only way we can do that is making sacrifices. This is what chapter 3 is all about. This brings us to chapter 3. Chapter 3 is all about work. <laughs> it's all about work. If you go and read it, it's about work. So we can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. But if we don't work... Hello? It's about work. Now, everyone... And that's why I call the sermons... Um, theme building together because if you read this chapter it stands out all more than 40 families working together and they actually built that wall in 52 days <coughs> it's a lot a lot quicker than what we <laughs> <laughs> building a church yeah and I think we must get them all together Saturday <laughs> Just to, just to mention, you know the walls that they still have in Jerusalem that were built by in Nehemiah's time were six meter thick. Yeah. And um, there, there's different views. Um, they don't actually really know all the gates and what, where the wall was. But some, some people think it was only nine hectares. Others say 22 hectares because there were two parts. But, but that's a long, that's for, for a, a six meter wall built in 52 days. I think it can be done. Apparently, this wall, okay. And there were two, ten gates mentioned here in chapter 3. So if you read through chapter 3, you'll find that ten gates are mentioned. And um, uh, I'm not going to go to each gate and see if there's any spiritual meaning behind it. I think that's grasping a bit of going a bit too far but but they are important I'm going to mention uh, one or two of them and uh, we also find in chapter 3 a long list of names okay a lengthy list and the question I asked myself is why Nehemiah why didn't you why did you make a list of everyone and why did you put them up there who did what and who did who I think it's important so I'm going to do, do two things I'm going to talk I'm going to talk today on two ideas. The first one is the people, and the second one is the project. So hopefully we can um, learn something here this morning from chapter 3. Now, looking at the people, we see that the people, when they heard Nehemiah and his request and his plans, they immediately started working. Okay, And there are a few things that we can learn from these people that are listed in this chapter. Now let's go to verse 12. I'm going to jump to verse 12. Verse 12 says, Next to him, Shalom the son of Haloesh, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired he and his daughters. Now why am I <coughs> pointing on this scripture? He says, the father and his daughters work together on the wall. Now, and sometimes we have this wrong impression that only men do all the work and women stay at home and they do all the cooking. Am I right? 
But this verse tells us that even the women and even the daughters also picked up a hammer and a trowel and they built alongside their father. Everyone was involved. If we see the people in this chapter, we see everyone except, okay, one or two, and I'm going to mention it at the end. And what, and I just thought to myself, what a great honor when a family can serve the Lord together. What a great honor to work together in the kingdom of God when husbands and wives, when sons and daughters can serve together. And when I read, thought about this, my mind goes back to what Joshua said. And he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But I know it's not always that way. I've learned through the years in ministry, and this is a sad thing because I do believe husbands should be the preferred Gordon van die Huis. But I've learned through ministry all the years that there are more women in church than men. I don't want to go too much in that, but when I read this, I felt in my heart. <coughs> So I specifically want to pray for families this morning. I want to pray that our families, may you serve the Lord together as a family. Maybe your spouse or your children or your husband or your parents, maybe they don't know the Lord. And I pray that God will work in their hearts as a family. You will serve the Lord together. Now, also we are not told in this, this chapter about the we're not the ages of the people are not mentioned, but I, will, I I'm not. I would not be surprised if both young and old were involved in building the wall. And for us, it is so important that the young people and the old people are involved in church life and ministry. And with the holiday club that passed, I was so grateful to see the young people working together, giving. <coughs> their time, their energy, their efforts to make this event such a successful event. And I'm grateful for that. And we should actually, um, we should, as we promifia, we must uh, uh, allow the young people also to minister in church. Now, it was, it was probably not, uh, it was probably easy to say that there is so many people in the city they won't need my help. I'm not qualified to build. I don't know how to lay a brick. I don't know how to do carpeting, uh, carpenter work. It is so easy to bury your talents simply because you have never done that work before. But almost everyone, and this is what this chapter makes it so unique, everyone worked together. Everyone. How to get the to say together. <laughs> Building together. It was a concerted effort. And can you, and, and let me just dream a little bit. Can you imagine if every one of us goes out and makes disciples? <coughs> you know what? That church that we built there is going to be too small. I'm dreaming now, but you know, the only thing, the only reason why this will happen is if we make the sacrifice. The necessary sacrifice. And if we as a church work together. Now, Tom Keller says the following. He says, There has been a movement away from the ministry being done by just one or two leaders to it being done by the whole people of God. This is what his, this is his comment on Nehemiah. He says, normally it was just one or two leaders, but now the whole people of God, rebuilding the people of God is the work and the hope of the whole people of God. Everybody has to do it. And we think because we, we pay a pastor a salary, it's his work. Hello. Okay. I'm going to pray more. <laughs> Chapter 3 also tells us 
who worked on what part of the wall. And that's very interesting, and I wish I had the time and the resources to really go and see it, all the detail, but I want to just mention a few. So, there are 10 gates mentioned. Obviously, if you go to chapter 12, there are another two gates that they talk about, and there are 12 gates at, of the city of Jerusalem, and if you go to, to, to Revelation, and you read about the city, New Jerusalem, you read about 12 gates. So, I don't know if there's any reason, uh, meaning, spiritual meaning around that, and I wish I could uh, delve more into this, and I'll probably go into it and find out. But, what I've seen is um, that the first gate, let's go to verse 1. <coughs> verse 1 says, Then Elias, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. Now, the sheep gate was the closest gate to the temple. And this is the gate that was named the sheep gate because the shepherds used to bring their flock to the gate and sell it. It's like an auction. Okay? Saturday auction, you go there, you buy the sheep and the bulls and things like that. Okay? So they would sell their flock there and it was also through this gate that all the sacrificial animals were brought to be offered, to be sacrificed. And the ministry of the temple, you must realize this, the ministry was the work of reconciliation, which is the heart line of Israel. And it is there where the work begins. And this is for me interesting. Maybe I'm reading something in it, but that is where it begins. Ministry starts. Uh, ministry must be first secure. That's what they did. And it started by the sheep gate. It is at this gate where the work not only begins and it ends in chapter 3, is where the work also ended. So it started at the sheep gate and it ended at the sheep gate. And interesting, the high priest and the brothers, the priest, what did they do? They rolled up their sleeves and they got their hands dirty. And they worked. And I believe that is what we as leaders in the church also should do. We should set the example for others to follow. Verse 17 we read, After the Levites, re after him the Levites repaired, Herm the son of Bani, next to him Hashabiah, the ruler of the, uh, the district of Kaila, and um, repaired for his district. Now, just that word, the, the Levites. Now, here are the Levites also repairing and rebuilding. Now, the Levites were those who read the scrolls and they worked with pen and paper. They were the ones who studied the law and expounded the law and explained it to the people. But they, what are they doing? They're working on the wall. Also read about the ruler. Verse 14 we read, uh, Malchia the son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hacharem, repaired the dung gate, he rebuilt it and set it do its doors its bolts and his bars. Now, I want to show you something on this scripture. The, it talks about the ruler of the district. District. Now, the ruler was of, but he was a leader of the community. He was probably like today we'll call him the mayor. Okay? He was the leader of the community. And he worked at the what gate? Duncan, who, wanna, who wants to guess what what gate that? <laughs> the blue <poo> gate. <laughs> Kids understand that. No. This, this gate is where all the garbage and the sewage and all the things were transported out the, the city. So you can just imagine what a wonderful smell and a fantastic view you had in the building of this gate. Preparing it. And who was repairing this? The leader. The leader working on a not so glamorous job. And yet he was not ashamed to work at this gate. And I think we can learn from this. I think we can learn. All of us can learn from this. And how we apply this to our life. You see, when you come as a volunteer and pitching in, 
No one can stand on his position or his status and say, I'm sorry, this is not my job. I, uh, I want something that fits my profile. I want something to do that is according to my status. And you know what Jesus said about this in Matthew 20, 19? He said, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. So this is how the kingdom of God works. Okay? The economies are upside down. We have to work where the need is. We have to work where the need is, where, and if we like it or not. Now, in verse 8, we also read about Uziel, the son of Har Hayar. And look, what is his um, work? He's a goldsmith. And next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, repaired and they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall, six meter. They call it the broad wall. You can go and look. They still have that, um, some of the wall, uh, old wall uh, today. Now, a goldsmith and a perfumer. These people don't normally lay bricks. But now with their soft hands, and I always make the joke, I said, this hands are only made for one thing, and that is to lie. <laughs> My wife wants me to do something, I said, no, this hands are only do this. Okay. Their soft hands and delicate noses. They were lifting rocks. And working with a trowel and a hammer. They were working together. Everyone believed in the great cause. They looked beyond their self-interest. They saw God's plan. Now listen to James Hamilton, one of the commentaries. He says, if we are going to live for something more than our trivi uh, trivial agendas to make our own names great, we must be convinced of the truth, goodness, and beauty of God on displaying the gospel of Jesus Christ and advanced in the work of the church. A great cause that calls you to greater things than your own interests and your own pursuits. Now the second thing I want to point out is the project. If you read through chapter 3, you'll find all the work that needed to be done. Now, interestingly enough, I want to show you something. Um, you can go through the whole chapter, you'll find this. And next to him, the man of Jericho built. And next to them, Zakur, the son of Imran built. Verse 4. And next to him, then, Merimoth. And you go on. And next to them, be sure. And you go on. And next to them, and you go on through the whole chapter. And after that, and after that, and next to him, and next to him. Uh, 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 why do I point out this? Because the plan was very simple. This was the plan. Obviously, that no, I got them together and said, "This is the plan, guys." Okay, build the portion of the wall just in front of your houses. That's all. Just build a portion of the wall closest to your house. But in order to do this, you need to cooperate with one another, with the one next to you, beside you, because if you don't make sure the wall is going to meet at the same place, you're in trouble. Okay? So you need to work next with the guy next to you. And also, you don't throw your rubble out of your area to the neighbor next to <laughs> So you have to work together. <laughs> you did your part, but you worked together. Now, five times, five times in chapter 3, we read of those who worked on the portion of the wall right in front of their houses, and often we need, we need to give attentive attention to the work of God right in front of our own lives, our own homes. This is where ministry starts for each one of us. Each one of us. The early church grew rapidly. And it grew through evangelism. And the question is, but how did they do evangelism? How did evangelism happen in the new church? Now listen, there were no 
Billy Graham's. There were no great preachers on pedestals. There were no programs for the church. And it was a dangerous thing. And I know, I know, Doug, sorry, forgive me. He asked you to invite your people, your friends to the church. You can do it today. But in those days, you didn't just invite any non-Christian to church tomorrow, you might be dead. <laughs> might kill you. Christians were persecuted. But the point I'm going, I want to make is, how did they do evangelism? Everybody evangelized. Every person evangelized. And you did not rely on great preachers. You did it yourself. And this is something we can learn from Nehemiah 3. We must only do our part close to our home, close to our families, close to our colleagues, where we are busy every day. That is where you share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't need to go to India. On a mission trip to share the gospel. Listen, your colleague, your family members, your neighbor across the street is just as lost as the person in India. The ministry of the people of God requires all the people of God. You must do it. But, Pastor, I am a goldsmith. I am a perfumer. I'm a Levi. <laughs> I cannot lay bricks. I don't know how to talk to people. You know what? Let me be honest. Then Jesus made a great mistake by commanding every one of us to go and make the signs. Amen. Or are you just making excuses? There were those, obviously, who did not join in to help build the city. In this we read from chapter 3, verse 5. He says, And next to them the Tekoites prepared, but their nobles, <laughs> interesting, would not stoop to serve the Lord. Their nobles did not help. See, they thought they were too good to help. It was beneath them. And may we never get to a place where we think we are too good enough and noble enough to share the gospel with our friends and family members and neighbors. May we never think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Let me close. This most important, the most important qualification you need for the work of the Lord is availability. Not ability. God's not looking at ability. He's looking at availability. The person with less gifts and talents who are passionate and, and driven for God's work will accomplish more than the gifted person with no passion and drive. May we never forget that Jesus, the Son of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be crossed, but He emptied Himself and took on the form of a slave. It was not beneath Him. And Paul says in Philippians 2, 5-7, that this mind that was in Christ must be among you. I, I, I think you get the picture. If we really get God's worthy course and His, His vision for our church in this community, if you really grasp that, nothing will stop us. But we need to make a sacrifice. We need to make that sacrifice. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, this morning I want to come before you and I want to, we all want to say sorry, Lord, for not doing what we're supposed to do. 
Lord, I want to pray for each one of us that we will see your redemptive purposes and plan for us in this community. That we will just um, understand this morning what you want from us and what you called us to do and be. I know, Lord, there's also this morning families that desire to worship you together and serve together in the kingdom of God. And I know there's husbands, there's wives, children, parents don't know the Lord and I pray for them. Lord, only you can make a change in their hearts. Only you can save them. And I pray for our families this morning. May we decide, as Joshua said, Lord, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Even if it means that we need to put our own interests aside. Lord, help us. Help us this morning. Help us to make a difference. All we need to do is make that difference in front of us. Make the difference around us. And work together as a church. I pray this for us as a church. I pray that you will help us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.